been preparing this for, for many hours. Also, I want to ta thank uh, our four guests who are with us online. They are watching. Uh, I will introduce them next. Before that, I would like to tell a bit of instructions of how the session is organized because we have put a, a very interactive session. So you can also join the session, ask your questions. It's a bit different from what it is in the program. The speakers will first uh, give their five minutes uh, uh, statement to begin uh, with their uh, uh, position. You will get to know their uh, background and positions. I will introduce them. And after that, we will have the questions. So you can actually join the discussion by posting your questions on menti.com. And also from the beginning, we have a few quizzes and questions uh, that we would like to ask you to participate. So please just now go to menti.com and use the code 7366284. I repeat, 7366284. And participate in, a, in this panel discussion that we have today. Uh, also, my colleague Don Reinders is uh, with us here. He's a PhD student. He's actually behind the Mentimeter. Sorry for uh, uh, breaking the, the flow. And uh, he will actually choose the questions, so uh, keep them coming. Well, it's hard to miss the news that, uh, yeah, we have a catastrophic uh, path ahead of us uh, with the trend of warming and with the actions which are not uh, stepping up to keep the our planet in the safe zone. Last year, 2020, was again the, the warmest year recorded. And we all know that if we do not stop emitting greenhouse gases very quickly, then the consequences will be dire. And these consequences are not only for uh, the low-lying nation like our land, but perhaps there are billions of others who are even less prepared and they will see the worst consequences of this warming. And today, we will pose one central question. Uh, is the physics community ready to play its role for this enormous effort? Some of you, as I know physicists will do, will immediately you know, question the exactness of this uh, statement. Yeah, what do you mean by uh, dire consequences? What do you mean by quick enough? Uh, or you might say, you know, physicists already contributed a lot. We have made the nuclear reactors possible. Uh, we are making the solar panels more efficient uh, every year. So, yeah. Other people will say, you know, dealing with the social, societal consequences is a job of politicians and not uh, the physicists. So, yeah, I'm going to ask our panelists, is that really so? And this is a discussion that is going on at this moment in many scientific communities, and I think the physics community also should engage in this discussion. It's, of course, not a very easy conversation. Uh, I would like to save actually my skin a bit, so I'm going to start with appeal to authority uh, by quoting a slide from uh, Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson is a well-known climate scientist at the University of Manchester. He gives advice to the government of the United Kingdom, to the European Commission. And in this slide that I captured online, he posed this question, this self-reflection for, uh, for the academic community. Are we leaders or are we laggards? He states that we have done a great job to apply science to understand the climate change, maybe also the consequences of it. But we have been also uh, a bit reluctant in uh, you know, emphasizing the direness of it. We have uh, relied on utopian technologies. We have neglected how fast this thing can happen. And also our practices are you know, quite uh, carbon intensive by themselves. Can we justify those? These are the questions which are not easy to answer. And uh, Kevin Anderson puts it so bluntly that I wonder maybe he have spent a couple of years already in the Netherlands. So today, with the help of our guests, we try to figure out together uh, how is this possible. Are we, as a physics community, acting as leaders or as logards? So before we start uh, to invite our panelists on the screen, I would like to ask uh, a few questions from you to know about your background. So if you are a menti.com, please uh, fill in your occupation. Are you a PhD or postdoc? There might be a bit delay, so uh, just go to the slides and start filling the answers. Are you from industry? Are you a faculty member? Uh, 
Okay, the answers are coming in. So we have now one third PhD and postdoc, getting a quarter, faculty members as well. A lot of people other than PhD and postdoc and faculty member, which were the main participants of this conference. Oh, the PhDs and postdocs are joining in. The young are getting. Okay, so then comes the next question. How would you describe your main field of research? Just to get a feeling of what type of uh, audience are watching this session. You can just fill in words. Particle physics, climate science, photovoltaics, quantum, climate, plasma physics. Well, I welcome you all. Thank you very much for joining. There is another question for you. And this is this is a statement. Do you agree or disagree that the physics community has done its contribution in forming about climate change and the rest is up to the politicians? So you can pick a side. Well, quite some people agree and some more, maybe three times more now, disagree with this statement. And we are going to look now how much more can we do. And there's also another question, a quiz question. And the quiz is, what is the expected range of warming by the end of century uh, 2100 under the current government plans? You can only vote uh, with exact digits, but we will do the averaging for you. Is it one, two, three, four, five, or six degrees? Okay. So the average guess of the participants is 3.6 degrees, uh, which is actually, if I follow the climate action tracker for the announced plans, the expected range is between 2.7 to 3.1. And for the commitment, it's a bit lower, uh, it's between 2.3 and 2.6. But in either case, it is more than uh, the safe, according to IPCC, uh, safe warming of two degrees that uh, everybody has promised. So I would like to now welcome our first speaker, Professor Julia Steinberger. Hi, Julia. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. You're joining us from Switzerland. So, Julia Steinberger is a professor of ecological economics at the University of Lausanne. Julia is uh, actually a physicist by training. Uh, she obtained her PhD at MIT under supervision of Thomas Kreitag and Daniel Kleppner. You know Dan, from, Dan Kleppner from the book. The topic of the thesis was ultra-cold, metastable hydrogen and trapping deuterium. After her graduation, she turned the focus of her research to social ecology and relationship between the use of resources and performance of societies. She is currently a full professor on the social impact of climate change at the University of Lausanne and the principal investigator on the Leverholm Trust project, Living Well Within Limits. She was also the lead author on the IPCC 6 assessment report for Working Group 3. Thank you very much, Julia, for joining the discussion. You posed also a quiz for uh, our audience. So um, we are going to post that on Mentimeter. Please uh, answer to Julia's quiz. What was the stage of human development last time the atmospheric CO2 concentration was as high as today? Maybe it's a bit small. Was it A, medieval times, B, Neanderthals, C, Australopithecus, three million years ago, or Tanetianus? 15 million years ago. So, walls are coming. The majority are going for C, 3 million years ago. And I really want to have a discussion with people who said Tanitianus because that's something I invented. Okay. Julia, welcome. Uh, I asked you actually to tell us about your assessment. Uh, 
maybe you can set on your voice as well, where we are now and as part of the academic community on the issue of climate and uh, where should be heading to. Maybe you would like to share your, uh, your uh, slides. Uh, Don will turn them for you. So, Thank we're going to so start. Much. Floor is yours. Thanks, Sonny. Uh, thanks, Sonny, and thanks for the invitation. And it's all amazing to be here and to see your, your setup. Um, so, if we could just go to the slides, please, and just go straight in for it. I know we have very little time. Uh, so, I want to tell you my statement of the problem, which has already been discussed a bit by Sonny, my statement of the solution and the problem with the solution and how you can help as physicists. So, on we go. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, okay, so I really like this plot, which is rather complicated, so just bear with me. It's from a paper in PNAS by Burke et al. Um, in 2018. And so you can see to the left, we're going into the past and the scale changes. So we have 60 million years before present all the way into the future on the right side, where the scale is much uh, wider, so 50 years per interval. Um, and I think the most important thing to understand here is that what we're doing with climate change is we're kicking the planet in a way um, that has not been kicked before, certainly not during the time uh, of, of humans or of our species. And um, the important thing to understand is that we have benefited from a fairly short, stable interval in time. So we as a species have benefited from the past 12,000 years, the, the, st the state called the Holocene. And that's where I sort of put over this plot, agriculture and civilization, because civilization is really dependent on the ability to feed lots of people. And so that is the time when we developed agriculture. And it's this very narrow band of fairly warm temperatures compared to the previous time where you can see in the past, we had these dips which correspond to the ice ages. Um, and Homo sapiens appeared, so our species appeared about uh, maybe 250 million, uh, 250,000 years ago um, during that sort of ice age, uh, uh, that sort of time of oscillating between ice ages and sort of more um, warmer temperatures. And what we're doing in terms of climate change, what Burke et al. did is they compared our future temperature with our past temperature. And what they're basically saying is, listen, if you go into the far past of the planet, we're warming it, it was a lot warmer, and we're kicking it into stages that correspond you know, not just to hundreds of thousands of years ago, to millions of years ago. And in fact, uh, we'll be kicking it into a state that's about th corresponds roughly to 3 million years ago by 2030 on our current trajectory, or by 2040 if we slow down uh, emissions or reduce our emissions massively. And if we keep on our current trajectory, so roughly 50 million years by um, 2150. And so I think that this is something just to sort of put ourselves into the perspective of the changes we're doing. We are, we are kicking our planet out of the space, climate space during which we were able to do things like develop agriculture. And that should be extremely worrisome to everybody. And, it should, and the rapidity with which it's happening, I think is also uh, worry. Can we go to the next slide? Um, okay, so I call this one the thermometer and the unicorn. So as Stanley said, 2020 was the warmest year on record. CO2 atmospheric concentrations increased the same amount as in 2019, so roughly 2.5 ppm increase. Um, nature is not healing, okay. <laughs> um, that's not happening. Uh, and in fact, we're accelerating in the wrong dis direction in the sense that uh, CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere that the derivative is going up or accumulating ever more every year um, on average. So to avoid catastrophic warming, so to stay within 1.5 degrees roughly as per the Paris Agreement, emissions need to decrease by roughly 5 to 7 percent on our current baseline per year, which corresponds to 1.5 to 2 gigatons per year. And in my view, and I don't think uh, I'm not the only one to say this, I would say Kevin Anderson is somebody else who has that perspective. Um, this can only be done by reducing demand. So mitigation has to correspond to reducing demand for energy, which includes transportation, of course, cement and animal-based food, which are the sort of main big categories of emissions and land use change uh, contributing to global warming. So my view of the unicorn, and maybe this touches on your magic of physics topic for your, for your conference, is that anybody who wants to grow demand while reducing emissions at that kind of rate is really banking on um, magic. A, ma a new magic technology, which is going to be super effective, not suffer from any flaws, and can be deployed at scale within the next decade or so. And that just doesn't exist. So for the, the kind of change we're facing, I would be much more comfortable if we were reliant on reality rather than on magic. Um, but there's a problem with relying on reality and the reduction of the, the idea of the reduction of demand. So if we go to the next slide. 
Um, so we have a problem, which is that we, we are living in a system that I believe to be influenced very much by ideology. So we basically have a secular religion around economic growth. And this is something that the physics community has dealt with historically. Um, we've had lots of problems with religions. Um, and, in, you know, if you think about the correspondence between heliocentrism and geocentrism, um, economic growth is a bit like that. It's a bit like the earth is at the middle of the world. You, economic growth is at the middle of the world. Uh, so all social goods are automatically ascribed to growth. Countries compare their goodness based on economic growth rates. And the problem with this ideology is that it is not empirically checked. And economics is non empirical science, as many of you might know already. But um, if you do check it, you find things that, for instance, like 80%, more than 80% of growth accrues to the wealthiest in um, society. Growth leads to rising inequality, which is something that Piketty showed. Economic growth can only account for a small fraction of the improvements in life expectancy internationally. That's something that I um, demonstrated. Uh, and growth cannot be decoupled from resource use, multiple references, Wiedenhofer et al. is a good uh, overall review. So we really need to have a much more empirically directed reality-based understanding of what our societies and econ economies are actually up to. And um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so this is my proposal as a mission for physicists. So I would really encourage everybody to do empirical research on how we can achieve universal well-being while decreasing demand for resources. And my group did an example of this, but it's just a first example. I think a lot more could be done, but you could check out Millward and Hopkins to 2020. Um, I think uh, another area is creating novel economic models that explore growth proof societies that basically say, how can we allow our economies to function without growth? And Simone and Alessandro and his group in Pisa have done this. Um, and I think it's a really interesting direction. I would say becoming socially and politically engaged is necessary. That's not optional. That's not like a side um, topic. Uh, saving the planet is not a spectator sport. And I would really encourage us all to learn from past physics-led effort like uh, Josef Rotblat and his organization Pugwash and his efforts on nuclear disarmament. And if we go to the next slide, um, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995 is in my view the most important Nobel Prize ever awarded to the physics community. And it was awarded jointly to Joseph Rotblat and the Pugwash Conference that he founded for their efforts to diminish the part played by nuclear arms in international politics and in the longer run to eliminate such arms. And I think that that's something that we can really be inspired by and try to move uh, much more into the policy space based on our understanding of reality and try to argue, for instance, for the, the, an equivalent, which would be the non-proliferation of fossil fuels. And uh, with that provocation, that's why I will leave it. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Uh, because of time, I quickly go to the next uh, speaker of today, uh, Professor Detlef van Fure. Uh, he is a, a professor of integrated assessment of e global environmental change at the Faculty of Geosciences at Utrecht University. And for 20 years, he has been working uh, on models and scenarios uh, at the PBL, that's the Netherlands Environment Assessment Agency. Uh, his research focuses on uh, climate change, scenario analysis, integrated assessment uh, of the climate change. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Detlef. You also sent slides. Please uh, start your statement. Okay, thank you. Um, so the graph that you're now looking at, um, I can't see it yet, so let's see where I can see it myself, yeah, um, is one of the reasons why we're discussing this, which is the increasing CO2 emissions historically. And my job uh, as a day job is to look into scenarios um, of how this could develop into the future. And we do work that was quite similar uh, to the work that was presented earlier on COVID, which is trying to use computer models to make scenarios of the future. Can you click? And one of those scenarios is shown here, which is a continuation uh, in the absence of uh, increased climate policies. And what we expect is a further increase in emissions. And in the end of the century, you would have emitted another four to 5,000 gigatons of CO2. So what would this lead to? And can you click? Now, here we have another branch of science uh, made, made by meteorologists and biologists that have created com computer models that can look into the impact of temperature of uh, increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you summarize that work, 
and you plot it as cumulative CO2 emissions on the x-axis and the out outcome of temperature on the y-axis, you can actually see that there's a very strong relationship. And uh, that relationship is very strong for the whole uh, area. If you look into a specific part of that relationship, you can see that there's also quite a bit of uncertainty. That's because of the different models. Now, if we now look into this four to 5,000 kicketons of CO2 and we look into what it would lead to, that would lead to about three to five degrees of warming. Now, click again, please. From the IPCC report, we also know what that would mean. It would mean enormous sea level rise uh, by and on century scale, for instance. Um, it's unlikely that it would mean that the Netherlands would still uh, uh, be able to cope with this. Um, we would have, we'd see impacts on agriculture, droughts, risk of large scale dis disruption of the climate system, biodiversity loss. So probably something that we want to avoid. Can you click again? And so uh, luckily, the world already agrees that we want to stay well below 2 degrees and preferably even below 1.5 degrees. And we can use the same graph to see what that would mean. Can you click? Yeah, and so that would actually mean that for 2 degrees, we can emit about 1,000 kicketons of CO2. And for um, 1.5 degrees, uh, uh, about 400 kicketons of CO2. These are numbers from the IPC report in 2017. By the way, we have emitted another 150 gigatons of CO2 already since then, so you have to distract that from these numbers. We can now go back to the earlier graph and see what that would mean in terms of emissions. And so the red line is consistent with staying well below 2 degrees. The blue line is consistent with staying uh, at 1.5 degrees. And you can see it's a dramatic uh, shift in the, uh, in, the, in the direction of the graph. But also, let's focus first on the two degree. It means going to zero in about 40 years. Now, most of the investments that we make today are expected to have a lifetime of 40 years, a power plant, for instance. And so following the red line already means that from now on today, you cannot build anything anymore that would emit CO2 emissions unless you are able to stop it before the end of its lifetime. The alternative, and that's shown in this graph, is possibly also taking maybe CO2 from the atmosphere. And there are different ways to do that. For instance, afforestation, but you can also um, think of more uh, technology solutions. That would give us a little bit of additional leeway, but not a lot. And can you click again? So we can then again use computer models to see uh, different solutions. And Unlike Julia, I really would like to emphasize here how enormously this uh, task is and that we need not only them all, but we really need also uh, supply side solutions, efficiency, possibly lifestyle change, but also negative emissions. Uh, everything is needed to, to reach this. And I, I, I really uh, think that supply side will be uh, the, the motor of the whole thing. I'm a little bit more um, optimistic than I was uh, five years ago in whether we could design something that is considered with well below two degrees. I think we have seen enormous progress in renewables and electric cars, which means that we now have a pathway to zero in power and service transport. At the same time, I think we, don't, we still lack solutions in housing, long stay, distance travel, high temperature in industry, and non-CO2. So there we have, remain, we have still have enormous challenges. And there I would like to repeat also what Julia said before. There's an important contribution still from physics in further developing solutions. But societal deployment and acceptance at least remain at least as important. I can emphasize that with my last graph. So can you click again? These two lines are actually the uh, current the effect of current policies. So all policies accepted now by parliaments, which we try to calculate. That's the upper of that little blue line. And then the second blue line that's slightly lower are the promises made by countries in implementing climate policy. And, and so while we're making progress, it's still far away from what is actually needed. And so we really have to uh, uh, further increase the efforts globally. Thanks. Thank you very much, Detlef, for this clear talk. And we go to uh, our third speaker, Professor Albert Polman. Professor Albert Polman is a professor at the University of Amsterdam of Photovoltaics and Photonics. 
Albert Pullman is uh, one of the early pioneers of the research on uh, nanophotonics, and his research group focuses on realization of nanoscale metamaterials with Taylor optical properties, also design of novel photovoltaic architectures with enhanced power conversion efficiencies, what Detlef just mentioned we need. He has been the director of uh, FOM Institute AMOL for seven years. This is coinciding with the time that I did my PhD there, and it didn't take seven years, though. So I'm very happy for you, uh, that you accepted to join us, Albert. Please uh, start with your statement. Yeah, thanks very much, Stanley. And uh, let's move to my uh, slides right away. Um, yes, the next one then. So I want to talk a little bit uh, the per about the perspective of have the physicists done enough or what can we do more as physicists and give you a few examples uh, more on the technical side now. Uh, and then in particular from the field of photovoltaics, because that's what we do at AMO with our research program. So you see the map of the Netherlands there. And so if we're optimistic and say uh, by 20, well, whenever, 30 or 50, we want to have half of our energy that we use in our country generated from photovoltaics. And with energy, we mean all the energy we use. So that is fuels, uh, heat and electricity. Then that square that you see up there drawn in the North Sea of about 40 by four square kilometers, that's the area of solar panels you would need to generate all that power, okay? So of course our country is not gonna be relying on uh, PV only. Uh, we're very strong in wind. There are other sources of renewable energy, uh, hydropower that we get from other countries and so on. But just to set the scale, right? So is this a big or a large square, right? I mean, if it would have been 10 times bigger, we would have thought, okay, you can never do, never do this, right? That square. If the square was 10 times smaller, we would have already done it. So 40 by 40 square kilometers, that's quite a challenge, but it's not impossible. So we have area on our land uh, available to you know, use part of that, that square, and some of the panels have to go somewhere else. So, okay, this sounds very technical, but I just first of all want to give the impression or the, the information that it's a it's a giant problem. We have to think really big, but it's not impossible. So let's see on the next slide how that evolved and uh, over time. Uh, the left plot has a lot of data in there, but roughly it tells uh, on the bottom, uh, the horizontal scale, it's how much solar panels do we have installed on the planet so far. It's a few thousand square kilometers. And the vertical axis is the cost. So the cost of solar has dropped dramatically over many decades and a, a typical energy from the solar uh, field in a sunny area on earth costs only two cents per kilowatt hour, right? Two cents per kilowatt hour is really cheap. Uh, and uh, you know, you can, you can dream if you lower that a little further, a cent per kilowatt hour basically means electricity becomes free. Right? And if that's the case, you can solve lots of problems we have on earth, not only just energy, but also creation of clean water, agricultural aspects, many more. So costs are going down. And then, uh, so that's good news. And then on the right side is installation. So how much PV have we then uh, installed over the years? And how much do we need to say, if we wanna cover 30% of our energy use by PV, that's just a number, by 2050, 30%, we'll get there. Because every, day, every year we have about 16% growth in the PV industry, right? There's not a lot of industry that grow every year by 16%. So that's very impressive. And you see the exponential curve, actually brings us exactly there. That's 30% of all our energy generated from solar power in 2050. But you can also see from the exponential graph and also from what the previous speakers have shown, it's too late, right? If we only get there by then, if we only then start generate you know, significant amounts of PV, it's too late. So that's another message. We have to increase the production of renewable energy technology. And this is just an example for PV. The PV manufacturing has to go up by a factor of 20 or 40 or so to make this happen. That's a giant challenge. And then I think the next slide is my last one. So challenges in energy research. So what do we need to do as physicists or chemists or material scientists and engineers uh, to make this happen at a very large scale? And it's interesting that in many energy technologies right now today, what we really need to do is another factor of three in performance. So in PV, for example, if we could lower the cost by a factor of three or so, then uh, uh, you know, it becomes possible to and, and affordable to do this at a very large scale. Or if we increase the efficiency by a factor of two or three, you know, then that whole square will shrink in size. It's extremely important to uh, enhance efficiency to reduce the area that we need. 
The same is true for batteries, right? If electric cars could have like three times more capacity in their, in their batteries, we would be there. They would drive for 800 kilometers easily, all of them. Same aspects in wind turbines or other uh, uh, you know, energy technologies. The factor three is sort of coming back uh, in many cases. But a key thing that we haven't solved well is uh, storage. I mean, of course, in batteries, but that won't uh, do it at a very large scale. We have to solve uh, store energy in either liquids or gases. And, and that's where really major research efforts are essential. Then we can do this all in the lab and we can say this will work on a large scale. But then my second bullet there, it says it's the technical uh, deployment, right? So and this is this upscaling. We need to increase uh, manufacturing by giant numbers. It also means we have to maybe change the technology we use. Maybe we cannot scale up silicon technology to very high, high rates. Maybe we have to work with roll to roll, uh, say proskite thin films, new materials that are coming up. So we really have to look into alternatives that can be speed up and, and make this technology uh, go much faster than it's being installed today. It also says infrastructure challenge, right? Because to incorporate this all in our country and infrastructure is also a giant effort. And that obviously then brings me to the end here and the last uh, extremely important bullet, the social acceptance. Uh, it's politics, it's public debate, you know, uh, can we do this, this infrastructure change? Can we deal with it? Do we want it? And just in general, of course, this very important discussion about uh, we, as scientists, you know, we, the panel members looking at each other here, everyone attending this session, we are in a bubble, right? We, we know, we understand the technical discussions, the economic discussions, some social aspects, but how do we convince our uh, society at large that this is a really important problem to solve? Because it's not something that bothers us in the next few years or 10 years, it's really long-term. And uh, just not everyone can think at that time scale. And I think that's where I want to conclude. Thank you very much, Albert. And our uh, final panel member uh, is Dr. Marjolein Hausnoot. Okay, Marjolein Hausnoot, uh, she is an environmental scientist specializing in water management, integrated assessment model, modeling and decision making under deep uncertainty. She is an associate professor at Utrecht University and senior researcher at Delta Res. That's the institute which is responsible to keep our feet dry in the Netherlands. And she leads the strategic research program on climate adaptation. So we're going to ask her, actually, when, does it, when is the water coming? She's a lead author of a sixth assessment report of IPCC at work group two. Marilyn, please, uh, your statement, you can begin now. Yes, uh, thank you. I also uh, have some slides. They're coming. Are they? Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, I wanted to um, maybe start with my uh, conclusion is actually that um, the previous speakers talked about uh, climate mitigation, which is of course uh, very important. And in the meantime, adaptation uh, to climate change is uh, inevitable. Um, they also talked about the uh, uncertainties about the future. And maybe despite this uncertainty, adaptation is needed. And also because of these uncertainties, adaptation is needed. Uh, so many uh, solutions exist already, um, but as, um, um, Professor Steinberger already uh, mentioned that we are kicking our um, planet out of the stage that we have been, that we are used to uh, from the past. And we are actually also doing this for our coastal regions. We are kicking these um, regions out of what they have been um, uh, used to. Um, so innovation is needed to address the large challenges that we face. We are also doing that uh, very rapidly. So that is also uh, challenging adaptation um, and we need to use the time that we uh, still have to um, to adapt but also avoid that we uh, make ourselves uh, more vulnerable and uh, have enough time to uh, to prepare so i will go to this uh, uh, a bit more in detail for the netherlands um, with this slide summarizes a, a report that we uh, published um, uh, three years ago uh, about the consequences of sea level rise for the Netherlands. And as maybe many of you know, is that we are well known about uh, water management. Without uh, water management, um, the Netherlands would not exist. Um, but um, climate change is challenging uh, us. Um, and with rising sea levels, what we try to do here is, the, um, is to independently of the scenarios, because of this large uncertainty, we assessed 
at how much sea level rise we have important consequences and um, not only at the amount of sea level rise but also looking at the rate so as, as an example we have this major uh, flood defenses the massland barrier uh, and with one meter of sea level rise it will close uh, three times a day uh, a year well in fact it needs to be open to uh, most of the time um, to um, to have um, to ensure accessibility of the of the Rotterdam uh, harbor so um, with sea level rise it closes more often um, and with 1.5 meter it closes about um, uh, <laughs> about 30 times a year um, and that's almost most of the time um, and not only that we need much more sand to maintain uh, the coastline which is impo uh, very important for uh, safety against flooding um, so um, with 10 millimeters a year, which is very realistic that that might happen in, in the um, uh, beyond 2050, we need three times more sand. But it would also be possible we would need um, 20 times more sand by the end of the century. Um, so the, our flood defenses will close more often. We, we need much more sand. And at the same time, uh, salinization is causing um, an increase uh, in fresh water demand, we would need to pump uh, um, um, at the polders more, oft, uh, more often and with larger capacity. Um, but not only that, so these are about the strategies that we would need. And if you go to the next slide, um, which links to um, um, the rapid change. So time is also challenging uh, adaptation. Uh, in this example, it shows uh, different scenarios for sea level rise. Uh, for the um, 2100 um, and if sea level would uh, rise uh, would follow the dashed line then a measure uh, up to a half meter of sea level rise um, the lifetime would reduce uh, uh, so if we start with half meter sea level rise then the lifetime would be about 65 cent, um, years and then uh, it would be reduced to 20 years and 10 years so if we would take adaptation measures of half a meter and then another measure of again half a meter and uh, again half a meter, then this lifetime would be um, incredibly reduced. And half a meter, maybe you think that's not much, but half a meter is um, it's a little bit more than what this massland barrier, this huge barrier and the whole uh, infrastructure in, in the Delta works that we are famous as. Um, they were designed for 40 centimeters of sea level rise and the aim was that that would be sufficient for the next 200 years. So this lifetime is incredibly reduced. And then if you look at the lead time, the time that we need to prepare and start implementing such measures, um, had that may take up to 30 years if we look into the past or maybe 20 years. But then, um, yeah, we are already in the next decade that we need to start uh, prepare. And with rapid change, if we are unable to, to mitigate uh, climate change and um, climate uh, rises much faster, then also our adaptation needs to uh, occur much uh, uh, more rapid. Um, so if you go to the next slide, for the Netherlands, we have uh, considered some um, adaptation strategies uh, for high and rapid amounts of sea level rise. These are just really sketchy uh, images, but we looked at, uh, at that in more detail, like what would it mean? Um, for an example, how we would close off and protect at the Netherlands, um, if you look at the, uh, the upper left, but then we would need to pump out the rivers and we would need huge pump capacity. And not only that, we cannot build this huge pump capacity for the rivers that we have. We also need uh, storage, uh, temporary storage. So space is also needed. Um, and space, uh, as many of us know, is very uh, scarce in the Netherlands. So we need innovative solutions that combine different space uses or flexible solutions uh, that we can adapt much uh, more rapid. Um, so there's other solutions which go uh, seaward into the sea with new islands um, uh, and there's more like uh, solutions about accommodates um, which require more like uh, a floating um, solutions or um, yeah that live more uh, with water if we go to the next slide um, these are just examples of some 
experiments or solutions that have been implemented. Uh, so on the upper left, it's like uh, uh, two states uh, levees that can overflow, can overtop, but will not breach. Um, uh, on the lower left, it's like um, a parking uh, spot uh, in the dune area. In the middle, there's um, willows that protect uh, the, the levees against uh, big waves. Um, and on the upper uh, right, it's like a bubble screen to avoid salinization. And then the lower left is about flexible building. So these are just examples that I thought maybe the physics, the magic of the physics can help us to adapt with more adaptive and flexible solutions that can be implemented uh, rapid. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, you'll stay with us, we'll soon come back with the panel. Well, uh, well, I think after hearing some uh, seriously concerning and heavy information, we need all some time to digest and we all deserve a cat picture. So I introduce you to Assel or a cat. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all of our panelists uh, on the, if the technical people can help me to have all the staff, uh, all the panelists once more uh, uh, on the stage. You can actually now ask your questions. Uh, if you go to menti.com and use the code 7366284, you can post your question there, but you can also see other people's questions and upvote them. Please post your questions. Uh, it takes some time to gather these. Uh, if you are watching from YouTube or uh, from the conference uh, uh, platform, you cannot use the chat. You really have to put your questions uh, into the Mentimeter. And while the questions are gathering and Don will collect them, uh, I'll give you a tip. You can put Dear Don in front. So you may get an advantage. I have some questions gathered from uh, before. I'm going to ask our panelists uh, these questions that I've gathered on social media and from my colleagues uh, before. And I will start with uh, Julia. Where are you, Julia? Yes. Ah, here. OK. So fantastic. Julia, you have actually written also about uh, discourses of denial. And this is the question I received from a PhD student. And his question is that how to overcome the academic denial and not denial of facts, but of implications. I think that's a really big question. I mean, we come, we come across this in, um, in almost every way when we're trying to build programs or trying to change teaching or trying to convince other areas that maybe they should be integrating this teaching as well. And um, I think that there's a lot of lack of information um, throughout academia. And I'm not quite sure how we deal with it, but I think that this is something that we should, uh, we should be making bigger, bigger efforts to um, address. And I think that in some cases, going through university leadership, if you can get somebody within the university leadership that is willing to listen to you and get the message across, that can help change programs very fast. So uh, if that doesn't work, then other tactics have to be tried. But I agree, it's a big problem. Sorry, I don't have any great solutions. <laughs> Okay, my next question is uh, for Detlef. Uh, Detlef, you mentioned, there must be a circle, but you mentioned actually about uh, the, the technologies that we need. I'm in the other screen. Yeah, it's here. Okay. So you mentioned about, uh, uh, yeah, it's confusing for me as well, uh, about the scenarios. And we actually had in the previous uh, talk that scenarios are not forecasts. And uh, now we have the discussion of the information and misinformation. And recently, after the disputes over a certain election, there was also the uh, statement on social media that some claims are disputed. Again, a PhD student have asked me that uh, uh, for some of the uh, solutions, like, I don't know, negative emission technologies at scale, should we actually paste that this claim is disputed when we are announcing these? I think it is really important to realize that these scenarios are not forecasts, but are explorations of different uh, so solution strategies. And many of them have their strengths and weaknesses. And yeah, especially with the negative emissions, uh, that's a very difficult one. Yeah, because um, if you choose to go that way, with, and there are advantages in terms of the transition, and um, then obviously at some point you really rely on them. It has a mortgage uh, character uh, and that, that is difficult for decision making. Uh, still, I think that for 1.5 degrees, it's quite clear that there's no pathway 
towards 1.5 without negative emissions. And so that's also something that we should accept. So there's some kind of a program in trying to, first of all, develop these technologies further, but secondly, also to think of how to make decisions in a way that we do maximum effort now, uh, but at the same time, uh, try to see how negative emissions fit in, I think is useful. But uh, it, it's true for all solutions. So we can also, I think uh, demand, we all realize that demand is reducing demand is an important part of the solution. But uh, there, there too, uh, we have huge challenges in how to, to implement that and convince society to follow that. And, and there too, you have the risk of uh, emphasizing something that doesn't come true in the end. Okay. Thank you. I have a question next for Albert. So you actually communicate a lot with decision makers for many years. You have been institute director, you have been in various uh, scientific uh, high profile meetings. So it seems that the knowledge is there, but the actions is lagging. So how, how do you assess this gap between the knowledge and the action at the level of policy and also even scientific policy, science policy? Yeah, it's true that I think the research in all these uh, energy fields is very scattered. Uh, also in my field of photovoltaics, if you see how you know the funding is organized in the Netherlands on the larger scale, it's completely scattered. There's not a, just a single uh, coordinated plan from the government or from our funding agencies to do this. Uh, while we do, we do need a kind of moonshot, uh, uh, you know, initiative to do this, right? We just cannot do it with the way we do science. We are used to do science with exploring small projects, growing national programs. That works fantastically for you know how we've commonly done science. This needs to be done differently. We need the moonshot approach. And maybe we can think on a larger scale. Also, the United Nations is thinking about coordinating energy research. That's also technically very difficult to do. So maybe we can start in our country to organize ourselves better. And it needs an initiative from the funding agencies. If and I'm just talking technically, right? What do we need to do in research? It needs an initiative from the funding agencies to say, okay, we want to spend so much money on energy research and then we'll do it. But who can convince the funding agencies that this is a strategically important uh, direction? Well, this is a good question, right? So if you go on the street and you ask a, you know, a, a general person and say, look, let's assume you have a hundred billion euro to spend, right? And you can solve a major problem. You can choose, you have two choices, right? One is to solve climate change the other is to solve cancer, right? That's already a very difficult discussion. Everyone knows someone who has cancer, has had it themselves or has been. So, so these are very difficult things to balance, right? And it's very difficult to ask the scientists themselves to solve this. I mean, if you ask a physicist, what do you want? You have say a hundred million to spend now, right? not a hundred billion. You can do two things. How do you solve climate change or you build a big uh, telescope, right? It's all very fascinating. It's all right. It's all good to do, but you cannot ask you know, these people to make those choices. Everyone has their own interests. I have them. Astronomers have them too. So we need somebody at a higher level to decide for us what is important to do. And that's what we need to uh, talk about. Thank you, Albert. So please ask your questions uh, uh, on the menti.com. Uh, I have just one question from Marilyn, and I'll see if we can actually go to the questions from the audience if you bring them. Uh, to, to the panel. But before uh, going to the attendees' questions, I would like to ask one question also from uh, Mario Line. So uh, you, you showed this graph, which is very enlightening for me, that, uh, uh, yeah, that you know, if you wait, I don't know, 20 years or 10 years to, to sort of start acting, then you have to do that also twice faster, which I would actually somehow translate it also, it will be twice more expensive or four times even more expensive, which means that for every uh, euro that I save, my generation saves in doing these adaptation plans, my daughter's generations have to pay four euros, for example. H how is this justified? How is this actually considered in these models? Or is it at all considered? Um, well, it's a very good question. I think some uh, research uh, is going on on this uh, question, but um, I, I don't know if it's really uh, considered in, uh, in decision making. Um, it's not only that uh, adaptation needs to occur much, uh, much faster and that you kind of delay the cost, but it's also that in the meantime, decisions are being made. And these decisions also influence the solution space that we have for the future. Uh, for example, if we, if we use the space that we have now, then there's less space for future solutions. Or 
if we uh, make ourselves more vulnerable, then there's also less space. Um, yeah, we need to do, we need to adapt much more. I guess, um, yeah, I find it more like an ethical uh, discussion also um, that decision makers and researchers need to uh, mention this and, and, and quantify that if, if we, the, that the decisions that we take now um, also affect future generations and needs yeah. to be considered. Thank you, Marilijn. I see we have 2021 20, questions coming, so I skip the rest of the questions I've prepared and I, I go mm -hmm. to the, directly to the questions from the attendees. And the first one with 15 uh, upvotes is, uh, do we need a scientist as Minister of Energy in the Netherlands? So I'm going to ask that first from Detlef. Yeah, so maybe starting first with uh, Albert's uh, idea of the MD, uh, NWO program. And so we also have the Wopke Wiebes Fund. And I, I think at, that, at this point of time, uh, we have to go beyond uh, research. Research is really important, but we need a really, really big program on implementation and making the transition. And so that would be a very high priority. And there you would need a minister of climate change or energy uh, that's uh, would obviously see this as a big part of his activities. Um, whether that is a scientist or not, uh, I'm not uh, convinced uh, necessarily. We had very effective ministers of environment, for instance, in the part, part that were not necessarily scientists. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it needs to be extremely effective minister. It needs to be an important minister. It should be not necessarily economic affairs that takes this, but uh, something that is um, maybe oriented to climate change and the energy transition directly. Yeah, I see Albert also not, so maybe he agrees. Maybe we have another question, Dan. How can we get more scientists into politics and how important is this? Well, I'm going to ask that from Julia. I think everybody can be a scientist in politics. It doesn't take very much. Um, and I think that engagement in politics is something that has to become all of our jobs or activities. I mean, you can go and you have a right to go see a representative in parliament. I did that. I brought some printouts because I didn't think that there'd be a screen and I was right of just slides and I had a chat with him. You have the right to access your politician and talk to them. And he went from being not so interested in climate change to being somebody who actually uh, wrote about it publicly for his community and so on. So it's not just because of me, but it's one of the things that I helped happen. So I don't think, I think that it's not just scientists becoming politicians, it's us as community of scientists constantly interacting with our politicians at different levels. And this is something we can do. So uh, and then, them. yeah. <laughs> okay, next question is, uh, so, okay, Shell sponsors this conference and well, and many Dutch universities as one of the largest global emitters of CO2 and large greenwashing company. I'm just reading the statement. Should academia not take a stand and block this? Again, I'm asking Julia about this because I guess you have a standpoint on this. I'm afraid I don't know who the NWO is. That's the funding agency that's like the NSF in Netherlands. Okay. That's the um, organizer of this conference. It's from the Netherlands, so I know even less. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think that, uh, yes, I think academia in general should be uh, going towards CO2 neutrality as a block and funding agencies as well, uh, including with, you know, we have such a fabulous virtual conference, so maybe we can um, make all conferences virtual because that's one of the largest uh, ways that academia contributes to greenhouse gas emissions is just by traveling too much. Yeah, um, so there's... So we can, Craft policies factors. around that as well. Okay, we can go to the next question. How do you see the long-term future of the Netherlands? Should we give up a uh, large fraction of land? This is clearly a question for Marilijn. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a question to me, but I think it's also a question to society. Like, uh, the, that's not up to me to, to decide. It's like, uh, what, what we can do as researchers is like give the solution space and uh, and show what is possible and we can do a lot in the netherlands um, but we need to make decisions like do we want to protect keep the water out or do we want to live even more with water and give and maybe in some areas we need to give more room for water in the future so what are the ranges maybe you can help us what are the extremes or some of the likely cases um uh, of what we can address no, so how much you know of our land we can keep? Oh, I, 
No, we didn't look at that. Um, but I think had the, the plans that we have now, we, for example, we can uh, address about one meter of sea level rise. But uh, what we also see is beyond one meter, and maybe that is up to two meter, th there will be this transition when it will be very difficult to continue uh, the, our strategies as we do now. So that is where we need this innovation also from the physicists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question. It's about nuclear technology. It was mentioned a few times, but I think it deserves more attention. The past decade, a lot of interesting development have take, taken place. What do the panelists think of this? Didn't mention who should I ask? Who has an opinion on nuclear energy? Maybe Detlef, would you like yeah. to say something? As, as so, as I try to say uh, also during my presentation, we this challenge is so huge. Uh, we have to, uh, if you saw the line of the business as usual compared to where we need to go, we should not be excluding any, any solution. Then specifically on nuclear, uh, in the next few decades in the power sector, we have a competing candidate, which is even much more attractive, which are the renewables. Uh, nuclear, so solar and, and wind power have become so competing at the moment that cost-wise um, they are the winners at, uh, and it means that in the in the short term uh, investing in renewables and in and, and, and trying to benefit from the cost reductions there is, is the most attractive strategy um, at the same time, yeah, making sure that we continue to invest in, in nuclear development and, and ensuring that this option remains available, uh, certainly at the, at the point that it becomes more difficult to expand renewables, because at some point you, you have to deal with the intermittency here, which can be done potentially by uh, storage, but maybe also by other solutions, and, uh, might mean that we, we want to further invest in, in nuclear, but in the very short term, it, it, it's too slow uh, as a response option. Uh, and it's uh, at this point of time still too expensive. Okay. I have more questions. Oh, this one is about electric cars. New technologies make use of rare earth elements to scale resources, replacing CO2 emitting. With these only shift the problem, exploiting earth. Can you comment on this? I guess I'm going to pose this to Julia because you actually work also on uh, extraction. Yeah, I guess that one of the one of the things I want to say is that the this is one of the reasons why I think a focus on demand, managing demand, and reducing demand, uh, and removing overconsumption is really important, and it actually is a strategy that can help with the supply strategy of raising renewable energy and low carbon sources of energy to be the the a sufficient fraction, hopefully 100% soon. Of, uh, of the generation we need. And that's um, the, the less demand we have, the less extraction of other things like rare earth min minerals um, we will need. We will need a lot, uh, whether it's for ramping up renewable energy generation or for um, energy storage, lithium batteries, it's that kind of thing. So, uh, but again, if we move towards things like public transportation rather than private transportation, um, very efficient housing, very efficient buildings, uh, efficient delivery of energy services, and, and sufficient delivery of energy services, that will really limit how much we require. So I think that the, the demand and the supply are, are things that have to be considered as integrated, and we need to manage both. Thank you. I actually want to ask, ask a second part of this question from Albert, because a lot of this research is already ongoing. Uh, how is it at the fundamental level when actually uh, going for technology, are these resources also considered in, you know, investigating that even at the fundamental level or proposing that as a solution, Albert? Oh, of course they are. I mean, I mean, there's no way in, in the way we do fundamental science, you have to think about the long term applicability and economic aspects. So that's completely uh, connected to the research we do. And of course, the research is also about avoiding scarce elements. You know, can you make batteries in a different way so that you use less precious materials? So that's all uh, part of it. I also want to add on the earlier discussion, also when we talked about the Ministry of Economic Affairs and all the economics of everything, that it's also an opportunity, this entire transition to uh, you know, an, a new society running on renewable energy is an economic opportunity where it creates jobs, it creates uh, you know, uh, industrial activity, and that can also benefit a country. And it's very important in the way we convince our society 
uh, that we do this. I think most people uh, also when they decide about having solar panels on the roof, yet, yes or no, it's not because of climate change. It's just, it's because it gets cheaper. Your electricity gets cheaper. And if we get to that point, then we can make a real change. Yeah. We can have another question. Uh, scientists need to be credible and believable when scientists act as activists. This will possibly erode their credibility. What do you think? Julia, uh, can I pose this question to you? Sure. Um, it's a question I get asked a lot. I think that the, the actual, the reverse is actually the case. So that when scientists know something or are the guardians of knowledge that is so um, immense in its implications for the possibility of human thriving, um, and in, in the medium and uh, distant future, that we are not credible. We are not considerable credible in the public eye unless we act and have a voice in accordance with our knowledge. So I think that it's much harder to believe scientists when you say, oh, things are really bad. We need to change everything. We, we need to have a moonshot. We need to have a whole different economic and industrial strategy and change our lifestyles and so on. If scientists are saying that and are not at the same time trying to convince politicians and have a public voice, they are not credible. And I think that we gain credibility when we um, act with integrity. And I think that it's hard to act with integrity without some level of activism, given what's going on and what we know. And I would like to ask also, Maria Lein, because your, your field of research is something that has to do with daily life. You know, people want to know where to buy a house with a mortgage of 30 years. So how do you find this balance of how much you know, emphasize the things you know, but how much also just translate it into actual you know, the, the decision-making things of normal people? How, how do you make this balance for your own research? Yeah, interesting question. Um, it, it's a balance between like, um, yeah, just showing what you, what you know and explaining what you don't know um, being actually honest, but also give hope and um, and discuss and show what can be done. I guess that's a bit of the, the balance that, that I personally am in. Like, I see the urgency. I see um, how big the problem can be, uh, can be, because we can still avoid a large part of the climate change. And there are a lot of solutions. But if we use the time wisely, then also a lot of a lot is possible, and um, yeah, I feel that we have to uh, tell the, the the public also and 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 the government that action needs to be taken, and um, and we need to use the time wisely, huh? so because we need to accelerate our action uh, and implement what we already know. Yeah, action should be taken wisely and quickly. Next question, I see questions are increasing in number. So how can a global response exist if new sanctions exist to force industry governments to abide the set goals? Or how can physicists help these politics or policies on a global scale? Uh, I'm going to ask this from Detlef because you are in many of these international bodies. Yeah, but let's get up by, by the way with some of the colleagues here on the call. But uh, um, yeah, so globally, uh, we don't have uh, a lot of way to enforce policies. And so originally when they were creating uh, the climate treaty and in Copenhagen in 2008, seven, seven, they tried to have this binding global agreement with sanctions. It, um, the, what we found out that that makes, makes, makes countries very defensive. And so they, if, they, if there is a treaty with uh, punishments, uh, people want to do as little as possible. Uh, and so that failed, that approach. So globally, we have not a lot of other uh, options than to work with uh, the spirit of Paris, which is trying to uh, unite ourselves against climate change and do and, and, and make commitments for, on the country level that uh, try yeah, to, to that are in, in principle voluntary, but then at the same time uh, are negotiated further. Yeah, and but then once you get to the country level or the European level, obviously. Uh, policies need to become binding, and that's already happening. Uh, so uh, climate policy is getting real, and for instance, the uh, emission trading regime that we have in Europe uh, now gets prices that are getting serious, uh, with uh, nearly $40 per, per ton of CO2, 
And, and so, yeah, sure, we need finding uh, policies at the, at the national and uh, European level. Thank you, Detlef. Can we have another question? Do you think that NVO, that's the Dutch uh, education uh, organization, should give priorities with giving our grants to projects tackling the climate crisis? Uh, I'm going to ask this from Albert. Albert, what do you think? Should we have a priority for climate? Well, priority, you know, I can, I think we should change somehow the system, how the funding system is organized. I mean, you cannot have in every call that you give prior to, priority to a certain kind of research. I think you have to define in advance how much money you want to spend on particular topics. And right now that's a bit free for all. So we have the national science agenda, for example, that is meant to address the big societal problems that we have in our country. And it's run for two years now and it's already spent 200 million euros. And none of those projects really was directly targeting uh, sustainable energies. So why is that? Well, because there's not a strategic steering of how all that money is spent. So I think we should, uh, before we hand out the grants, we, before that we have a discussion, how much as a country, how much in our science funding do we want to spend on sustainability research? And maybe the same for medical research. And, and that's the kind of discussion we should have. And Julia, you also have, uh, what do you think, who, who should decide of this you know, distribution of money on a strategic level? I remember you had this conversation about this. Um, I think that's I think that's a bigger question, but I think that uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that the, the the past disciplinary divisions and how we used to allocate funding for research and knowledge were based on past problems. And right now we, we're seeing really big um, societal and environmental challenges. And I think that that's one of the things that um, hopefully it can be done in a participatory way through academies of sciences, through uh, engaging engaging bodies of scientists to decide those new priorities. But I think that that would be really helpful would be to open up um, that discussion and say, what should we really be funding? Should we, we be funding disciplines because they've existed and have had those funding streams in the past? Or should we really be trying to tackle the problems we have right here, right now that are getting bigger every day? And I would hope that the answer is the second. And I think um, programs like Future Earth, uh, which are sort of international programs around uh, what science priorities could be uh, chosen, I think that those would be really important to look at as well. Thank you. Well, we have maybe five, six minutes for more questions. So I'm going to do three, four questions as much as time allows. But if you want to know about your favorite questions, this is now the time. Uh, so there's a question to all. Does the opinion of scientists weigh higher than of an average citizen when the effect is shared equally by both? Uh, what do you think that left? Does the opinion of scientists count more? I don't hear you, Detlef. Maybe. Obviously, uh, it's not. It's it's difficult to answer this question with yes. Um, uh, but the, there's a value in argument, and, and uh, obviously, the role for scientists is make sure that we uh, bring in uh, up the information uh, in order to convince uh, people, and uh, hopefully, then it's not either or the scientists and the average citizens, but both would be convinced that action is needed. You want to add to that, Julia? No. No, I think I think that's fair. Okay, another question. Do you think politics should be as strict with implementation of steps against climate change as it is with the COVID measures? Oh. Uh, well, we had a talk about COVID. Who would like to give a guess of the answer? Yeah, Albert. And I will ask Marilyn after. Now, yes, of course, it's obvious. I mean, this is the next big problem and it's an even bigger problem. So there's no doubt, we just have to be really serious about this. Marjolein? Yes, I wanted to say the same. We need to uh, yes, look at climate crisis seriously, both mitigation and adaptation. And what we see actually in adaptation is that we were already following this um, approach uh, of a root map um, and, and a dashboard uh, to monitor and adapt and implement our strategy. Um, but we need to act on it, just not ha have this idea, but also start acting on it. And, and, and we, I think if we are able to explain how serious the problem is, then maybe we will start doing it. Yeah. 
One more question. Should Dutch universities take a stand against the company, well, I don't, fossil fuel companies? I ask this again from Detlef and Albert, because you work at Dutch universities. Detlef, yeah. you go first. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit less in, try, uh, in this. I find, I find it difficult to, to, to play the blame, the blame game here. And so uh, Shell has a role in providing uh, oil at the same time the consumer has a role as well by consuming it and so both need to change and uh, the more important story is how can we make sure that Shell uh, tries to see itself as an energy company uh, more than as a fossil fuel company and uh, there are initiatives trying to do that for instance uh, active uh, shareholders uh, being trying to convince Shell to take on a more serious action and yes um, Shell obviously has an interest um, uh, but um, personally, I would say the strategy is more to try to convince that than to uh, knock them out. Albert, do you want to say? Yeah, to connect, definitely to connect to this. What we should do is uh, make sure a new industry comes up that develops and sells this renewable energy and uh, that that becomes the most important uh, energy industry. Okay. So we are closing, I mean, almost uh, less than... Uh, nine minutes to the end of this session. Uh, we would like to actually have to, a revisit of what we have actually uh, seen during the session. So uh, I'm going to post another question, which we asked already once to uh, all of our audience. Do you agree or disagree after listening to these talks and your thoughts that the physics community has done its contribution in forming about climate change? And uh, Okay, we're gonna let it compare how the result has changed. I'm actually going to post also pose a question to all of our panelists and also to all the audience. I have start with the panelists and I start with Marilyn. And the question is that, how do you personally feel about the approach of the scientific community uh, to the issue of climate change? And you can choose between relaxed and being concerned. It's about the approach of the scientific community. Marilyn, you want to express your feelings? Well, I think we are being uh, concerned uh, and we need to uh, act more together also and integrate our knowledge to find innovative solutions. Albert, how do you feel? Um, I think our community feels relaxed in the sense that they don't see, uh, many of us don't see the urgency of all this. Maybe that's not how you defined your question, but the that's what I mean. I mean, we're all uh, scientists and we should all be much more concerned about these things. That's exactly how I ask my question. Thank you very much, Albert. Okay. How do you see that, Lev? Yeah, I think in general we are concerned and um, we realize that, that something needs to change. But I don't think we all realize the urgency here and, and the speed. Uh, the, the graph that I uh, showed where uh, th there's this big difference between the current trajectory and where we need to go. I don't think many of us realize how close to the, the edge we are and how quickly we have to change things. And in that sense, I think some of the remarks that Julia made in trying to reorganize science to really urgent problems are very, quite important. And you, Julia, how do you feel? What is the approach of scientific community? I think we should be a lot more, a lot more concerned and, um, and also taking our own failure to change things for the past decades. So the, the knowledge about climate change as a science and where we were headed has existed for decades and we've not been able to change that curve. So obviously we're doing it completely wrong be, and I think that we should be doing a lot more um, research of how and why we failed. And I think this is why I'm going to take uh, issue with, uh, with Detlev and Albert's answers on, on Shell. I think that one of the things we don't have not done because we have not done that post-mortem is we have not researched the role that these companies have played in creating our present moment uh, through climate denial, through um, their control of public relations and the media and politics and their entrenched place in politics, their entrenched um, budget uh, funneling to themselves. They still funnel a lot of subsidies, including subsidies via Dutch research. I mean, I bet that there's more research money in the Netherlands going to support Shell's activities than there is to act effectively on climate. And I think that we really need to have a, a lot more of a reflection of who we're up against. And that's why I think that 
thinking of ourselves as aiming to take that industry down because that industry is not self-correcting. That industry is not listening to science and it does not, certainly does not have anything like humanity's best interests at heart. I think that that's something that we need to take a lot more seriously. We would like to ask the same question from the audience. So the next question is exactly the same question for you. How do you, who are watching this session from behind your screens, feel about the approach of the scientific community, our community, to the issue of climate change? Are you relaxed or concerned? And at the end of the session, we also would like to ask you after this to just give us your feedback. What do you think is your takeaway message from a discussion like this at this event? And I'm going to pose the same question also to our panelists as the last question. Julia, what do you, what's your takeaway message now that you had this conversation with you know, various scientists about this specific issue? I think, I think we need to be doing a lot more. I don't think that there's currently, um, I think we need to be doing a lot more communication to other fields of research. And it's not just physics, it's also history and sociology and the social sciences and humanities and so on. So I think that we need to consider our, ourselves as human beings at a certain moment in history first and as scientists second and um, cut across the knowledge we need in order, in order to move forward. And so I'm really, um, I'm really, still hoping that a big change can be made but right now i don't see any action towards it so that's something that's very concerning to me that left what's your takeaway message yeah um i think we have all argued uh, that uh, a big change is need, uh, needed uh, compared to where we uh, what what's currently happening and uh, for me, it means on the one hand, on the science uh, directory, uh, that we need to move, have this more integrated research towards solutions. But above all, it means action on the ground and a big investment program to make this change. Albert, would you like to share your take of a message while the audience yeah. are doing it? I, uh, I was struck by what Julia said about the fact that we should become more activists as scientists. And, and because I completely agree, but if that's the message that uh, everyone here uh, who's listening and uh, say as a PhD student or a master's student or any scientist takes away, it's already a success, I think, this meeting. And, and Julia also said that it's important because it's the credibility that you bring as a scientist to the debate, right? It means you can have more influence than others if you do it right. And I think what it means really, again, as a PhD student, you can say, yeah, look, but I'm so doing busy doing my research. I have to write my papers and my thesis and so on. Well, maybe it means you just have to write one chapter less or one chapter on something different namely how how were you as an activist what did you do during your phd to you know talk to the broader audience to society and, and like talk to the politicians i think we're all a bit shy that's how we're raised that's how we're trained at the university but this is a different time it's a different field and it needs a different way of working and uh, i think that's really important okay a chapter on the impact and Marjolaine, what's your takeaway message? Um, I think we all mentioned that um, had the changes that we face now are outside what we have experienced before and that it's going much more rapid than we experienced before. Um, so that's a, a huge challenge. Um, and therefore, I think we need to communicate the knowledge that we have. And, and you can see that as activism, but it's also just explain what we already know and explain that there's this uncertainty and risk that we are outside <clears throat> had this range that we have experienced uh, before and that is going very rapidly. So time is also very important. Yes, time is also very important for me. My time is ticking. <laughs> I would like to thank actually all the panelists uh, who joined also from early morning to rehearse this session and also all you who joined us with your questions and your opinions. I really uh, enjoyed uh, moderating this session, despite all the lights on me. And uh, we will take your questions on Twitter, social media, whatever platform possible, which we could not answer here. I will take it. Hopefully, the panelists would be able to answer this at other moments. Thank you all for watching this session with us. And uh, with that, I would like to close this session. Thank you all for participating.